All right, so this is 15.2 uh, video number two. I'm actually coming back with a second video a little bit quicker than I thought I would um, for something. Something happened and the first one just cut off on me. So I'm going to start example number four. More than likely, this will have to be three videos, but we'll see. All right, so example four, pretty cool thing that's going to ha happen here. So let's go ahead and just go ahead and do the integral as it's presented. So the integral goes from zero to two, zero to pi halves of x sine of y dy dx. So the first thing we need to do is the dy part. So the antiderivative of x sine of y with respect to y is gonna be a negative cosine of y. Again, remember, leave the x there. So it'll be negative x cosine y. And we'll evaluate that from zero to pi halves. And then don't forget, we still have the dx portion of the integral left. So let's go ahead and plug this stuff in. So let's see, cosine of pi halves is zero. So that's going to be zero. Minus cosine of um, zero is one. So minus negative x. So we're going to get 0 minus minus x, which is x. That's really nice because it's going to make this real easy to do the last part. So the antiderivative with respect to x here is 1 half x squared from 0 to 2. Plugging in a 2, we get 4 over 2, which is 2. Plugging in 0, we get nothing. <clears throat> so we get 2. This could have been done in a different way. And this is the thing that's really cool. A very cool theorem. It's this thing which is called... Fubini's theorem. <clears throat> Named after the famous mathematician Fubini. I actually don't know his first name. Um, pretty cool. It's a really cool um, theorem. It says if f of xy can be written as a function of x times a function of y. Notice that those are multiplied together. So one is just a function of x, one is a function of y. And all bounds are constant. So if those two criteria are met, then the integral from a to b, integral from c to d, of g of x, h of y, dy, dx, can be written as the integral from a to b of g of x dx times the integral of h of y from c to d dy. So what that's saying is if we have two functions that can be separated by their variables and all the bounds are constant, we can separate the two integrals, do them separately, and then multiply the results together. So let's actually show that it works in this case, and it does. In our double integral here, all the bounds are constant. We have 0, 2, 0, pi halves. I can algebraically and yeah, algebraically separate through multiplication, x and sine of y. So we can write this as the integral. Um, let's see, do the x part first. So 0 to 2 of x dx times the integral from 0 to pi halves of sine of y dy. We should end up with 2 at the end. So let's do them separately. The antiderivative of x is 1 half x squared evaluated from 0 to 2 times the antiderivative of sine of y is negative cosine of y evaluated from zero to pi halves. Okay, plugging the two in for the x part, we're going to get four over two, which is two, minus zero is zero. And then doing the y part, so negative cosine of zero is negative zero, I mean, so negative cosine of pi halves is zero, so negative zero minus Plugging a zero in, we get negative cosine of zero, which is one. So negative one there. 
So we get 0 minus minus 1, which of course is plus 1. 1 times 2 is indeed 2. It's actually a really, really cool theorem that we can use. Again, the criteria are that the bounds all must be constant and that you have to be able to separate through multiplication um, all of your variables. So let's go ahead and move on to the next page. Example number five, find the volume under z equals one minus x squared over the interval from y going from zero to two and above the xy plane. So in order to do this, let's first of all take a look at what does z equals one minus x squared look like in two dimensions? Well, it's only got two variables, x and z. So here's your x, here's your z. And if z is your dependent variable in this case, this is going to be a parabola which opens down, hitting one on the z-axis. So it looks something like that. Okay, that's kind of your projection into the uh, xz plane. But in three dimensions, we want this to vary as y goes from zero to two. And it also has to be above the xy plane. So I guess we're gonna need to know where these intercepts are because it's going to stop there and if you were to set um, that equation one minus x squared equal to zero you would get that that's one and that's negative one so now if we look at this in three dimensions i'll extend this part out over here a little bit so if we were to go ahead and draw the projected part It'd be one here, one here, and I guess technically one there. It's going to look something like that. That's one, that's negative one, that's one. But we want it to vary as y goes from zero to two. So really, one, two units out. If I kind of try and stay parallel here to the best of my ability. And then I were to draw the same curve from, from the base. There we go. So it kind of looks like that little piece of a tunnel or something like that. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the volume underneath of that surface. That Now, hopefully you remember that this surface is a parabolic cylinder. Parabolic cylinder. And this piece out here... This piece right there, that's what you call the face of it. So the idea is, if you think back to what we did in um, like Calc AB and ABBC or Calc 1 and 2, um, you would take something which in this case would be a solid. You would figure out what the area of the base was. In this case, it would be the area of this face. And then you would add all those areas up as you integrated them from one end to the other. It's the same general idea. We're doing exactly the same thing. To find the area of this base or area of the face, we're going to integrate in one direction, and then we're going to integrate in a second direction to add up all the faces. So that's exactly what we're doing. It's a little bit easier to do now that we have a double integral idea. So what we're going to do is we are going to say, okay, first of all, the function is 1 minus x squared. That's what we're integrating. I'm going to take a double integral. Well, let's see. What does x vary from? x varies from negative 1 to 1. Okay, we found that from the two-dimensional um, shape. And y is going to vary from 0 to 2 because that's what it tells us. <clears throat> so then we got to make sure that you keep the, um, the variables in correct order. So the first thing or the inner one was x, the outer one was y. Could have written them backwards. It could have done dy and then dx as long as I changed the two integral bounds. Um, and that would have been fine in this case. Not always going to be the case. We'll talk about that when that comes up. But in this case, well, let's see. Can we use Fubini's theorem? Does that work here? It sure does because I've got all constant bounds. And I only have x's in my um, function, so I can separate these things completely. So let's use that. Why not? So we're going to have the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 1 minus x squared dx. And we're going to be able to multiply that by the integral from 0 to 2 
of, there's no y, so it's really just dy. Technically, it's 1 dy. So let's go ahead and take the antiderivative, see what we get. So we're going to get x minus 1 third x cubed from negative 1 to 1 times the antiderivative of 1, which is y, from 0 to 2. All right, so let's see what we get. Plug a 1 in, we get 1 minus a third minus. Plugging the negative 1 in, you get negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1, so it's plus a third times. Plugging the 2 in for y, you get 2. Plugging 0 in, you get nothing, so it's just 2. So over here, we're going to get a 1 minus a third, which is 2 thirds minus a negative two-thirds, so two-thirds plus two-thirds is four-thirds, times two, which is eight-thirds. All right, so there you go. That is the volume underneath that parabolic cylinder and between, uh, and between the parabolic cylinder and the xy plane. It's the volume of that tunnel-looking thing. All right, normally that's where I would have stopped that video, but I'm going to go ahead and keep going on this one just because of the fact the first one stopped short so early. All right, example six. Just looking at example six, it's pretty easy to tell that because that 2x plus y is raised to the eighth power, it's really not going to be easy for us to use Fubini's theorem there. As a matter of fact, you can't use Fubini's theorem, even though all the bounds are constants which is great, I cannot algebraically separate the 2x plus y through multiplication or division or something like that. So there's got to be a different way to do it. And unless you want to multiply 2x plus y to the 8th out 8 different times, you're not going to be able to do this in the current form just with respect to x and then with respect to y. So we're going to have to go back to our old friend u substitution. <clears throat> well, what are we going to let u be? We're going to let u equal 2x plus y. <clears throat> and that is the composited piece. Remember, when you do u substitution, you're really letting u be the composited piece here. So how are we going to get that to work? Well, the first thing we want to figure out is, okay, we're going to let this be a u substitution, but we want to do the derivative with respect to x, since that's the first variable that I'm going to end up having to take an antiderivative of. So when we do the du part, it's du over dx. It wouldn't make any sense to do this as du dy because the y part is the outside of the integral. We don't need that for that part. So if I take the derivative of this with respect to x, we're just going to get 2, which means that du equals 2 dx, solving for dx we get du over 2. Okay, so now we can go ahead and do a substitution. So for our integral, we're still going to have the integral from 0 to 2. <clears throat> we're now going to have an integral of just u to the 8th times my new du, I mean, excuse me, new dx, which is going to be du over 2. And then don't forget, you still have to have your dy on the outside. Now, you can do this in one of two ways. These are bounds that we can change. So we can change the bounds, which might be the easiest. Or we can not change the bounds. Just remember to put everything back into terms of 2x plus y. But it seems to me like that's probably not going to be the best bet here because then we're still going to have a 2x plus y, which might be more difficult to work with. So I'm going to change the bounds. So remember when you change the bounds, you're going to take the bounds that were there before, in this case the 0 and the 1, and plug them in to get a u value. Remember we're doing this with respect to x. So if I plug 0 into x here, we're just going to get 0 plus y, which is y. So my lower bound is y. If I plug the 1 in for x, I'm going to get 2 plus y, so that is my new upper bound, 2 plus y. All right, so now we can go ahead and actually do the antiderivative part. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the two that's in the denominator. I'm going to pull it all the way out to the front of the first integral because we can always pull constants out to the front. It just makes it a little bit easier to do. And then I'm just going to be taking the antiderivative of u to the eighth du. Well, that's going to be one ninth u to the ninth. And we're going to evaluate that as going from y to 2 plus y. Don't forget your dy. Don't forget all the other stuff that still has to go in here. <clears throat> don't lose track of it all. All right, let's plug in the 2 plus y and the y and see what we get. So we're, I'm going to pull the 1 ninth out to the front, so we're going to get 1 18th out in the front. Integral from 0 to 2. Plugging in 2 plus y, I get 2 plus y to the ninth. Plugging in y, I get y to the ninth dy. Now we're down to one variable. So now you can pretty much do whatever process you know how to take antiderivatives doing one variable. The nice thing is here, yes, you could do a small u substitution for 2 plus y if you really want to, but since it's a linear function and the coefficient in front of the y is a 1, so basically the slope of that linear function is a 1, when I take the derivative of that with respect to y, it's just going to be um, 1. So I don't have to worry about doing a u substitution. I'm just going to take the antiderivative like I would normally do um, any other function. So it would be something to the ninth power. So that's the way I'm going to treat this. Hopefully that made sense. If you need to do the u substitution for the 2 plus y to do this, by all means, go ahead and do so. But ultimately, it's going to be that whole thing, 2 plus y to the 10th power times 1 tenth minus 1 tenth y to the 10th. And we'll evaluate that from 0 to 2. This is not going to be a very pretty answer. So I'm going to pull the 1 tenth out to the front. I can factor that out. So that's going to be 1 over 180. So then we'll have 2 plus y to the 10th minus y to the 10th evaluated from 0 to 2. So what are we going to get there? 1 over 180. Plugging in 2 is going to give us 4 to the 10th minus 2 to the 10th minus plugging in zero doesn't make everything go away in this case we're actually going to get a two to the tenth minus zero all right you could probably just leave it like that to be completely honest with you but i'm going to try and simplify it just a little bit and then this will be the end of that video so 180 let's see so that's going to be four to the tenth power minus 2 to the 10th, minus another 2 to the 10th. So that's technically 2, 2 to the 10th powers. But don't forget, when you multiply two things with common bases, so we really have 2 to the 1st times 2 to the 10th, you add the exponents. So that's really going to become a 2 to the 11th. So we get 4 to the 10th, minus 2 to the 11th power. I guess technically we could write that 4 to the 10th in terms of a base of 2. I'm not going to go that far. I'm going to stop there. Um, and if you're really trying to figure out what the volume is, obviously that doesn't make, make – that gives no real bearing to anybody. Like what is 1 over 180 times 4 to the 10th minus 2 to the 11th? What does that mean? So you would probably just use a calculator to do an approximated value in this case. And I have already done that part. If I plug that stuff into a calculator, it gives you 5,814.04 or so. And that makes a lot more sense to most people. That gives you a little bit better frame of reference. All right, that'll be the end of video two. We'll come back. I think we've got three examples left, and we'll finish this off.